Now, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, I think, just as inspiring as the music that we've just heard, if, if not even, maybe a little more so. I'm going to attempt in about 30 minutes to tell the story of how we all got here from the very beginning of the universe to now. So, you know, you're interested in your ancestors, how they might have come from Europe or some other country, Asia, or perhaps across the Bering Sea land bridge tens of thousands of years ago. The point is that we are innately interested in our history. And the early chapters of everybody's history I'd say the first three out of roughly 10 chapters belongs to astronomy. And those are the chapters I'm going to tell you about this evening. So the real star of our story here is the Milky Way galaxy. We would not be here without our galaxy. It turns out that it comes from quantum fluctuations. And just because I love animals, I'm dragging in something called Schrodinger's cat. And we'll be talking about the famous quandary of Schrodinger's cat later in the talk. But, as I say, the star is the Milky Way, the Milky Way galaxy, and I think one of the biggest problems that we all have in understanding astronomy is we just don't have a mental picture. We don't have a mental map. And so that's what the first part of my talk is going to try to provide. Here we are, we're sitting on Earth, and if you ever look at the sky, this should look like a familiar sight that you've seen before. That's Orion as we see it here from the Northern Hemisphere. Here's the belt, here's the nebula, the sword, and so on. What I'm going to do now is show you a video that starts out by flying towards Orion. Flies through Orion, out of the galaxy, into the nearby sea of neighboring galaxies. This is a remarkable video, and in just three minutes or so, it will give you the mental map that you need to understand the cosmos. So let's get started. We're flying to Orion at much faster than the speed of light. And the first thing that appears to you is Orion is disappearing. Orion is not a thing. It's not in one place. It's just a lining up of stars. And now we're flying to this cloud of glowing gas, the sword. Orion Nebula. Clouds like this are stellar birthplaces. They're stellar nurseries. This is where stars are formed. And young, bright stars that are massive are about a million times brighter than the sun, and their radiation lights up those gas clouds and causes them to glow. Here we are. We're flying through another one here. This is the Rosette Nebula. And in the nebula here, you can see the bright stars at the center that are lighting up that cloud. And now there is another nebula on the horizon. It's this one here. But this object is completely different. This actually is a star that is dying. This is an explosion of a supernova that went off about a thousand years ago. The Crab Nebula, and you can see its little pulsing pulsar at the center. We'll come back to supernovae later. They're very important in our history. And now this is the part of the video that I like the best. We're flying out of the Milky Way galaxy, and they've morphed it very artfully into an image of a nearby galaxy, catchily named NGC 5383. <laughs> this is NGC 5383, and the point is that from what we know about galaxies, this is a pretty good twin of our galaxy. And here are the Magellanic clouds nearby. You only see them from the southern hemisphere little dwarf partners. And now the camera swings around and we see another pair of galaxies about two million light years away. This is the Triangulum Nebula, smaller than our Milky Way, with its big twin, the famous Andromeda Galaxy, off there in the background. Andromeda is our big neighbor in space, a little bit bigger than we are. And now the camera pans around again and we're flying out of our local group into nearby circumgalactic space. And those of you who are amateur astronomers will recommend, recognize a lot of the pictures that we're going past here. This is M101. And coming up here is the Whirlpool Nebula, where spiral structure was discovered by Lord Ross about 150 years ago. This remarkable movie is real. It was made by this gentleman, Brent Tully, 
who made a career of mapping the local universe. And he, what he's done is he's taken an image, even one of these galaxies is a real galaxy, he's estimated how far away they are and put them in space at the right size and the right separations. So that there's only one thing that's fake about this image, and that is it's a lot brighter than it would seem to your eye. The galaxies are dimmer than this, and you only see them this way through a telescope. But other than that, it's real. And now we're flying in to a cluster with a giant, a giant elliptical galaxy, and at the center of this is a black hole, three billion solar masses. It's a good thing that the movie stops at that point. <laughs> okay, so I, I think you'll agree with me. This is a wonderful piece of pedagogy here that in a very short period of time um, gave you what you were missing, and that is a mental map of the nearby universe. And just by the way, to put some numbers in this, we just flew 120 million light years in about three minutes. And if you work it out, it turns out to be about six trillion times the speed of light. <laughs> so it's amazing what Hollywood can do these days. <laughs> okay, so um, let me move on to the next video. What my talk here is about is where these structures, these galaxies, are coming from. Okay, so now you know that a galaxy is a star city with several billions of stars in it. And that today, in today's universe, these galaxies are spread throughout space in a non-uniform way. In other words, the universe today is very clumpy. But the interesting thing is, it did not start out that way. It started out very smooth. And we actually can observe that in something called the cosmic microwave background which is a sea of microwave radiation that comes at us from all directions, which is almost perfectly smooth, not quite, but almost. And so we know that the early universe was a soup, a very hot soup of gas and other kinds of matter, but it was almost uniformly distributed. Today it's lumpy. Where did the lumps come from? The answer is from gravity. The early universe wasn't completely smooth. There were variations in density from place to place. We know from measurements that those variations are only about a part in 100,000. But a part in 100,000 with gravity over billions of years does amazing things. So put yourself in the universe just after the Big Bang. The whole universe is expanding. And let's center on a low, a peak of density. There's a little bit of extra gravity there. That peak is retarding the expansion and pulling in the neighboring matter. And the net result is that that peak gets a little bit bigger. And by the same token, if there's a density valley over here, it expands a little bit faster because it has less gravity retarding it. And so matter flows from valleys onto peaks. The peaks grow, the valleys get deeper and deeper. And physicists have a word for this. We call it an instability. An instability is something that can start out small, but grows sort of automatically, just due to the physics of the thing. And there's a perfectly good analogy in everyday life, economics. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. <laughs> and cosmic galaxy formation is probably the first example of economics in the universe, at least it's the only example that I know about. Now, given computers, we can actually model this process. You start in the computer with a uniform density of matter with small undulations, the peaks, and you let every particle attract every other particle under gravity. You set the whole thing expanding and you watch the... So what I'm going to do is show you now a modern video simulation of the formation of galaxies. Now, I have to tell you that there are actually two kinds of matter in galaxies. One form of matter is invisible, it's called dark matter, and it's five-sixths of all matter, and so it actually does most of the work. It's actually producing most of the gravity. But all the fireworks come from the other kind of matter. The other kind of matter is us. The matter of the periodic table, chemistry class, human bodies, furniture, planets, okay. All of that comes from the familiar atoms that we know and love, Hydrogen, helium, carbon, neon, uh, silicon, etc. Okay? 
It turns out that the only kind of matter that you can actually see in a telescope is the ordinary matter, because ordinary matter makes stars. Everything that we saw in that video that was visible was comprised of ordinary matter. The stars, the glowing gas clouds. However, holding that whole galaxy together and all the other galaxies that we saw was a lot bigger blob, a huge halo around each galaxy of dark matter. So we put both of those kinds of matter into the computer simulation and let her rip. And that's what we're going to look at next. Okay. So this video comes from Japan. And now we're only looking at the ordinary matter. Everything that's bluish here is a primordial gas cloud coming out of the Big Bang. The universe is really expanding, but they've taken the expansion out so that it looks um, more manageable here in, in the video simulation. The blue gas clouds are forming white stars. The little, there are little pinpoints of bright starlight that we'll see presently. And so there's a gradual transformation. Galaxies like a fire. A fire turns um, wood into smoke, flame and smoke, and galaxies turn gas into stars. Over time, there's less gas and more stars. As the matter falls into the center of a galaxy under gravity, it tends to be rotating the same way that water rotates when it goes down a drain, when it falls to the bottom of the sink. These rotating disks of gas make stars. And then, because the early universe was a very violent place with lots of these gravitational peaks forming and merging, the proto-galaxies run into one another, the disks get destroyed, all the pre-existing stars get thrown into a halo of stars, of old stars, and gas continues to fall in, leftover gas, and reforms the rotating disk. So the prediction from this very simple picture is that galaxies should be composed of two parts. They should have an older spheroidal stellar population that is in a halo and is condensed towards the center. And then there should be a mixture of younger stars and gas in a disk. And that is, of course, what we see when we actually look at galaxies. Okay, so let's observe that. Galaxies exhibit both disks and spheroids, just like the models. Here are galaxies that are mostly disks. And here is another form, family of galaxies, which have mostly spheroid. So it sort of depends. It's an accident on your collision history, whether or not your disks got disrupted and you turned into this form, or whether or not you were largely undisturbed and you stayed a disk. Nice picture, but do we believe it? How are we going to test something like this? Well, there are many ways that we can test because the models are getting very precise. One of the best ways to test is to look back in time. Wouldn't that be nice? Because you can see early on in the process, the galaxies were different. They were smaller. They were more ragged. They were colliding. They were more disturbed. And it was only later that the universe settled down to form these majestic spirals like the Milky Way we have today. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could actually see that process by looking back in time? And this is where I'm really glad I'm an astronomer because I get to look back in time. Okay. So there's something famous called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is the deepest image that has ever been taken of the universe. It, was, it used up two weeks of exposure time on Hubble. I estimate that it cost $20 million. It might be the most expensive image ever taken in the history of the planet, but maybe the dark side, those guys, maybe they've taken more expensive images. This is the most expensive image that I know about. It doesn't cover a very large piece of the sky. Okay, this is the Hubble deep field to scale against the moon. It's only about one-tenth the size of the moon. And in some sense, it is exquisitely boring. Here's what it actually looks like. Okay. The point is that if you aimed the Hubble telescope at any patch of sky that size, this is what you would see. Now, in detail, it's not the same galaxies, but what I'm saying is that statistically it's the same. Like, you know, looking at this part of the beach versus that part of the beach, the sand grains are statistically the same. There are a lot of galaxies in this picture, about 10,000 discernible objects altogether, 
And the magic of Hubble, it's high resolution, reveals a lot of wonderful detail that we can't see from Earth. Hubble sees about 10 times sharper than what we can see with an average ground-based telescope. We're trying to fix that here, by the way, at Lick Observatory. And if I have time, I could say more about it. It's called adaptive optics. Very exciting. OK, now, this is actually a core drilling out into space. There are some galaxies in the foreground, and there are some galaxies that are much farther away. That's how we travel in time. It takes a while for light to travel. So if it has to go a long distance, it's been going for billions of years. So you could think of traveling down this core drilling out into space. It's also a core drilling back in time. The nearby galaxies are one or two billion years back in time. But as we go farther and farther back, the most distant things that Hubble has seen are within about a half a billion years of the Big Bang. And the Big Bang was about 13 and a half billion years ago. So in this picture, and others like it from Hubble, we've captured slices of cosmic time almost from the very beginning up to now. But there's a catch. In order to really study the galaxies back in time, galaxy by galaxy, we have to measure the distance, which tells us the look back time. And unfortunately, galaxies vary enough that you can't just say that that one is necessarily farther away from that one. Size is not a good measure of distance. We need to capture more information about them. And it turns out that Hubble really can't do that very well by itself. At this point, we have to invoke ground-based telescopes. Ground-based telescopes are what the University of California is really good at. And we invented the technology to build the world's most successful big telescopes, a twin pair of 10-meter telescopes on Mauna Kea, called the Keck telescopes, at 14,000 feet, where the seeing and the air is, is superb. Now, a telescope all by itself is just a light bucket. You have to put a camera on it to make an image or a spectrograph to take a spectrum in order to get information. So one of the best and most interesting things I ever did in my career was build a spectrograph for one of the Keck telescopes. It's called Deimos here. And it was built in our instrument laboratories in Santa Cruz. It's a rather big instrument. Altogether, it weighed 20,000 pounds. It took about eight years to build altogether. Finally, it was finished. It was packaged up, and it was sent on a barge to uh, the big island of Hawaii, where, which is where Keck is located put on a truck, taken up to the summit, put into this dome. Uh, you know, a little bit of an issue, how do you get it into the dome? <laughs> but we thought about it. OK, here's a crane. It's going in through the slit. OK, and there it is on the platform. This picture was me and my crew about um, 20 minutes before we went down into the control room and took the first spectrum with the, with the, spe the, the spectrograph. And this is my parting picture. I took it just as I was walking down. This is the Keck telescope from the back. This is the mirror. It's a set of hexagonal segments that fit together, 36 segments. I'm standing behind the mirror now, looking out through the slit. And here is Deimos. And the very huge, big spectrograph that had always impressed me for eight years looked kind of like a postage stamp <laughs> once we put it on the telescope. So here's what. A s information from Deimos looks like. A spectrum runs this way. There are 140 spectra here all together. This is the blue end, and this is the red end. And now let's take a region here and blow it up so you can see it in more detail. Okay? Now it looks like there's a lot of information here. Look at all of these features here. This is blue, this is red. These are, this is a region where a lot of light, a color, uh, where lots of light is coming in. There's something there at that wavelength. False. All of this forest of vertical lines is produced by the Earth's atmosphere. It's a foreground glow called air glow, and it's just disturbing, and we have to get rid of it. OK, so we have image processing techniques that do that for us. We can subtract off all the vertical lines, and voila, when we do that, then we see some real features that are due to galaxies. So what I'm showing you here is a clump of four galaxies we're looking here about seven or eight billion years back in time. 
Okay? And how do we know that? Because if the galaxy was closer, this feature here, which is caused by oxygen, would be over here. If it's farther away, it's there. See, we're measuring the distance from this horizontal wavelength shift. And there are a bunch of other things that we can measure from a spectrum like this. I'll just summarize them briefly. First of all, the distance. How big is the redshift? And therefore, how far back in time are we looking? From the star formation rate, we can measure that from the brightness of these features. These features are coming from Orion Nebulae in the galaxies that uh, we see way back in time. We can also measure the widths of these lines, which tells us how fast gas is moving, the internal orbital speed. And finally, from the brightness of these features in different elements, we can measure the chemical composition. So it's quite amazing. Looking back billions of years in time, we can measure many, many things about these galaxies. So to make this more concrete, here we are at the Keck telescope looking out in space with the Deimos spectrograph along uh, one small slice of distance. Here are a bunch of galaxies at different distances. Here are some actual times with events that we're familiar with. Here's 4.5 billion years ago the Earth forms. And this is where our survey was most sensitive. Going back in time, about 7 to 10 billion years. So plenty of time to see galaxies like the Milky Way before our Sun and Earth even formed. So as I, tell, as I told you, it's possible to use data like this because the models are now so precise. They predict a whole lot of things. So an interesting thing to measure is something like this diagram, okay? This is the mass of a galaxy in terms of the amount of stellar masses it has. 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th stellar masses. And this coordinate is a measure of how fast objects are moving inside the galaxy internal orbital speed. And you can see that there's a relationship here. Bigger galaxies have higher internal orbital speeds. And we now can predict that in the computer simulations. And we get predictions that exactly match this kind of plot that we see here. And this is only one of many, many different kinds of comparisons that we could make to test these models. So the subject of galaxy formation is well in hand, provided we're willing to assume the initial fluctuations at the beginning. Now I'm going to take us back to the beginning of my talk when I told you about the cosmic instability, the rich get richer, the poor get poor. To get this whole process in motion, we need to put small density fluctuations into the universe. So here's a, a little schematic of that. This is supposed to be the early universe. Unbelievably hot, a temperature of 10 to the 27th degrees. Okay. So that's 27 factors of 10 strung together. And a very, very early time, 10 to the minus 35 seconds. What does 10 to the minus 35 even mean? Well, 10 to the minus 1 is a 1 with a 10 in the denominator. Okay, it's a fraction, 1 tenth. 10 to the minus 2 is 1 over 10 times 10, 1 over 100. So 10 to the minus 35 is 1 over 10 times 10 times 10 times 35 factors of 10. I don't need to belabor the point. It means it's small, right? <laughs> Okay, so what we're doing is we're, in order to understand this whole process, we have to go back to an instant that is almost the Big Bang. The Big Bang would be zero. We're not quite at zero. We're only 10 to the minus 35 seconds. Now, why am I talking about this? Why did I pick this pair of numbers, this temperature and, and this time? The reason is that this is a very special temperature. This temperature corresponds to a very special set of physics. The physics comes out of something called the Grand Unified Theory. The astronomers did not figure this out by ourselves. Our colleagues, the physicists, were worrying about this. Long about 1980, they were saying that at this temperature, if the universe were filled with that temperature, something very weird would happen. So let me explain what that weirdness is. Today, if I carve out a hunk of the universe and it expands, the density goes down. 
because everything there gets farther apart, so the density gets, it gets more diffuse, more dilute. At this temperature, the universe expands and the density does not go down. Completely bizarre. Totally counterintuitive. There's no way I can cultivate your intuition. I can't say, you know, just as you've seen a pot of boiling water, you know, and you know what that looks like. Well, just think of the pot of boiling water and think of it. No. <laughs> There's no analogy. It just doesn't conform to our notions of conservation of energy or anything like that. Now, when you put that kind of physics into an expanding universe, and this part is really remarkably simple, a certain term appears in Einstein's equations that tell you how fast the universe is going to expand. And remarkably, if the density is constant, the universe accelerates. It's a repulsive force, and it grows exponentially with catastrophic effects. So supposing you and I are particles in this, in this expanding universe at a time of 10 to the minus 35 seconds, okay? We start to move apart, but we go faster and faster without limit. Actually, we go faster relative to one another than the speed of light. If I'm watching you, I can't actually see you go faster than the speed of light. That's because if I'm watching you, you're going to disappear first. You're going to become so redshifted and your radiation is going to become such long wavelength radio radiation, I can't see it anymore. So I don't actually see you do that, but you are doing that. This, this particular epoch is called inflation. And it's a, a sort of an addendum to the normal Big Bang cosmology, but it's a very, very important addendum. Because, first of all, it creates the big space that we see. The huge space that's in the universe today, powers of 10 were generated during this era of inflation. We think that the universe expanded by at least a factor of 10 to the 60th, from 10 to the minus 35 seconds to 10 to the minus 32 seconds. A lot happened. But that's not enough. Just making space isn't enough. We have to get those density fluctuations. So let me finally come to the conclusion of my, my talk. Quantum noise. Okay. Quantum uncertainty, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, is a very, very basic aspect of modern physics. Okay. Oh, Alice, you're the one for me, but Bob, in a quantum world, how can I be sure? Okay. Why is she saying that? She, she is reminding us here, and Bob for that matter, that um, nothing is certain in a, quanta, in a world of quantum fluctuations. So let me give you a, a, the specific example that is governing here. Let's, I'm going to create a system, okay? A physical system by carving out a little piece of this room. There's some atoms in the system, they're moving around, okay? And I'm going to attach a meter to this system. And the meter is such that it's going to tell me the energy content of this system. Okay, so there is a rule in quantum mechanics that as I measure on shorter and shorter times, the fluctuations on my meter, my needle, will become larger and larger. If I measure for half the time, the measurement, the energy content is twice as uncertain. This is an element, an aspect of the, the so-called Heisenberg uncertainty principle. See, so her temperature is fluctuating for Bob. <laughs> Okay, so normally we don't notice this problem. This is coming and going everywhere in the universe, right here, right there. It's called vacuum fluctuations. We don't notice it because they come and go. And so on average, uh, we, we may get an upward fluctuation, we get a fluctuation to cancel out. We don't have to worry about this. But in an inflating universe, the problem doesn't, isn't like that. In an inflating universe, an upward fluctuation occurs. The universe is expanding so fast that the fluctuation gets frozen in. It becomes macroscopic. It's not quantum anymore. And so quantum physics doesn't apply anymore. We've created a fluctuation and it's become frozen in. And that's where all the fluctuations come from that have made galaxies. 
And I'm talking about fluctuations on a scale of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and they're turned into galaxies today that are hundreds of thousands of light years across. So I'm going to end with my analogy here, Schrodinger's cat. Uh, there's, this is a famous conundrum in physics and I think it's fair to say that physics, physicists really cannot still explain this. Okay. So it, it, somehow my computer is quantum fluctuating. It's doing things without me. Let's start over here, okay? Okay, behave, computer. Don't fluctuate. Okay. All right. So the essence of, of this uh, conundrum is connecting something that has a quantum fluctuation whose properties are unpredictable and fluctuating with a macroscopic system. The essence of the, the problem is, this is a quantum system, and because it's fluctuating, it's, we don't know if this atom has decayed or not. It just wants to do it without me here. Okay. okay, so its state is unknown until I actually observe it. It decays. Here's an apparatus in which I have connected it to a cat. When it decays, a hammer is going to, that will be detected by the Geiger counter, a hammer will fall, releasing poison gas, which will kill the cat. <laughs> the reason why this cute little system was thought up was, if this is a quantum fluctuation system with quantum uncertainty on very small scale sizes, how does that uncertainty, how's it reflected in the state of the cat? Is the cat or alive or dead? Unless I actually open the box and observe it. That is a very interesting question. Here's, that's what was illustrated here. Is the cat alive or is it dead? Interesting question, but what the point I'm trying to make here is that this little system, wow, this system connects a quantum event with a macroscopic event. And that's what I've been saying about our galaxy. A quantum fluctuation is captured frozen in just the way it's frozen in by the falling hammer here. The consequences are captured, conveyed to a massive system, and we're, we wind up with a galaxy today. So this famous story from physics lectures actually is the explanation of where galaxies come from. Quantum events frozen in, giving rise to macroscopic systems. So the last slide here, that is a, a sort of a philosophical slide. What have I been saying here? I've really been telling you that the universe consists of a whole wide range of scales with very different kinds of physics. It's a beautifully unified web from the smallest scales to the largest. Its properties in the large depend on its properties in the small. There's an essential unity in our universe. And if, I don't know if you're a religious person, or a non-religious person, but it really is very apparent that if we changed our universe in only the slightest way, probably we could not exist in it. So our relationship, the physics that we need, is the physics that our universe is giving us. And I think this theme is really summed up beautifully in this picture. Here we have the foreground. This is a real picture, by the way, an actual photograph. The foreground shows a Kiva in a cave in Arizona. And there are rocks in the foreground. This is the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way, out the mouth of the cave. And here are all these dust clouds. And it turns out that the rocks in the foreground consist of the dust clouds that are suffusing our Milky Way throughout the Milky Way. So here we have an example of this unity. Our planet is that stuff up there our galaxy is a quantum fluctuation from the Big Bang. Worth reflecting on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Perhaps we could turn the light on there. I think there's a switch right by the door. Can you grab it there? Ah, thanks very much. Great. So I think there's time for a couple more questions. If uh, if anybody wants to uh, press me on a 
So matter you, or two? You know, Go ahead. When you, when you explained about inflation, when you were separating yourself from, the, from this guy up front here. Uh -huh. um, You're back. I'm glad to see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some guy. How, how could you violate uh, relativity that way by exceeding the speed of light? I mean, in terms of the separation. Even if you can't see them, you're, what you're saying is you are separating. Yeah, faster. things can move faster than the speed of light if gravity does it for you. Okay, we, we really don't know any other way of separating objects, either making them come together or separating other than by using the force of gravity. But what we really can't see is we can't observe the object doing that. So there's a difference between what it's really doing and what we can see. And a perfect example is, which you might have heard about, is black holes. Things fall into black holes, right? And, and they actually do fall in, in a finite time, because the black hole does grow and we see it. But if we watch objects falling into a black hole, they disappear first. And they actually appear to, time slows down, so we never actually see them fall into the black hole. They're going at the speed of light just as they cross the Schwarzschild radius. So it's a, an interesting contradiction between what's really going on and what's observable. Yes? Yeah. How did the astronomers first discover the relationship between redshift and distance? They discovered it. Um, it was discovered by Edwin Hubble. He's probably his most famous discovery, the Hubble telescope, Edwin Hubble. And he discovered it in the 1920s. And what he did was, with a 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, he did two things. He, uh, first of all, he measured the spectra of a lot of nearby galaxies, which back then was hard to do. And he could see that they had different redshifts. And then he made some leaps of thought about standard candles and standard rulers inside the galaxies. And so he had very, very crude measurements of relative distance. And so he could see that the things that looked like they were farther away were moving faster. And that's how we did it. And then how, how is it quantized or refined so that we now have a you know, fairly precise relationship between redshift and distance? That has been an exercise that's taken the better part of a century. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say, and there are many different ways of doing it, because galaxies contain a whole lot of different kinds of objects. And if you understand that kind, you might use it as a distance indicator versus that one. The standard one is a a variable star called a Cepheid variable, which pulsates. And we have managed to calibrate the brightness of these stars quite accurately as a function of their period. We have some local examples, and we have other ways of measuring the distances to them. And then when we see them in distant galaxies, we know how far away they are. So we think that we've gotten the um, uh, slope of this relation to about 10% now, maybe even a little better than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Have we seen any evidence of the reaction from the dark matter that must be falling into a black hole? Yeah, so the, the question is, can we, can we see some sign of the presence of the dark matter? And you specifically said falling into the black hole. Yeah. Dark matter, I'm not saying that no dark matter falls into a black hole, but not much does. And the reason most of the matter that falls into black holes is ordinary matter. And by the same token, black holes are comprised mostly of matter that is ordinary matter now in the hole. Okay? And the reason for that is that uh, dark matter wants to stay diffuse. It does not radiate. It does not interact with electromagnetic force. It cannot radiate photons. And this means it cannot lose energy. The, the sun is radiating energy away and shrinking as a result. Okay. That's because it's made of ordinary matter. Uh, a blob of dark matter can be self-gravity. Our galaxy is, for that matter. But there's no way of the dark matter particles to lose energy and sink to the middle because they don't radiate any form of energy. The only force that they interact with meaningfully is gravity. So in a galaxy, the dark matter is this gigantic big halo that hasn't coalesced very much. And then the ordinary matter, you saw it falling to the center. All of those gas clouds were radiating and sinking to the center. So the stuff that comes to the middle and makes stars and black holes is ordinary gas. Doesn't the thing with Schrodinger cat require an observer? I mean, 
it doesn't it show that there's consciousness involved in the whole process of the universe? Well, you are remembering the more metaphysical aspects of Schrodinger's cat. I was not using it to make that point, okay? I'm not arguing that our galaxy is a fluctuation today that is or is not here or it requires us to observe it in order for it to be here. I was simply using the apparatus in Schrodinger's cat to illustrate how you could connect a quantum uh, phenomenon and make it have macroscopic consequences. And that's what happened in making our galaxy. A quantum phenomenon, a fluctuation, wound up having macroscopic consequences. So we're here today. We don't really have to worry about being a quantum fluctuation anymore. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. That pretty shows the four spectra of the galaxies and the oxygen lines. Some of them seem to have two lobes. Yes. What was the significance of that? Um, it turns out that that feature due to oxygen is a doublet. And the reason is that um, these energy levels, many of them are double, triple, even richer than that. And so we can get a photon by having an atom go from the upper level down to the ground state or the lower level down to the ground state. And those wavelengths differ slightly. And so we see two very closely separated lines. It's very common. Great. All right, well, if you have any more questions, happy to answer them.